So this particular uh, session will be on City Nature Challenge and Event Planning. We'll kind of go into planning for the City Nature Challenge as well as planning for other citizen science events as well. So um, we once again start out with the traditional treaty land acknowledgement where the afforestation areas are situated in the West Swale, near Earth Island Glacial Spillway a sacred site in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Those who entered into Treaty 6 are the Nahiawak, Cree, Nakawe, Soto, and Yankton and Yankatoni, Nakota people. May our relationships with the land, standing peoples, forests, and waters teach us to honor and respect the past and invite us to move forward in harmony. May we all come together as friends to find inspiration and guidance from histories languages and cultures which broaden our understanding and community collaboration for the present and the future. So citizen science. Alan Irwin defines, oh, we've got another, um, I'm trying to watch the waiting room at the same time. Hi there. So we've just started and had our traditional land treaty acknowledgements. Alan Irwin defines citizen science as developing concepts of scientific citizenship which foregrounds the necessity of opening up science and science policy processes to the public. So what does a citizen science event organizer need to do? Now, basically you have to decide what kind of event you want to run or what you want to achieve. You might want to just do a bird watch, a frog watch, do the city nature challenge using iNaturalist, work on a butterfly count or a plant watch. So after you narrow it down, you have to figure out what is your goal. And again, if it's a frog watch, you might be focusing on frogs. A citizen science event could include cleaning up a green space, locating invasive species. There was just the Bimby project in BC where they were trying to identify a whole bunch of butterflies to see how many species at risk and how many invasive species of butterflies there were. And they also wanted, to, and there was also a need to collect data for climate change. So it's the strategy that you want to uncover. So a great citizen science goal sets a focus grounded in science. The who, what, where, when, how, and why. And um, it can support the classroom STEM-based learning. Um, there's quite a few teacher resources available on iNaturalist, um, as well as from the organizers. Um, there's the U.S. organizers uh, that do the international project and then the Canadian Wildlife Federation uh, hosts the Canadian project. And then the Friends of the Saskatoon Afforestation Areas do the Saskatoon um, area. So it's a way to create earth warriors or stewards. It supports environmental protection, of course, and it helps to um, document our ecological and cultural diversity. Um, it's a great way for our students to learn about taxonomy, um, nature and ecology in an informal, non-taught textbook setting. There are quite a few universities using iNaturalist as a learning uh, resource for how to do different types of taxonomic research. Um, it's a great way to monitor climate change. There's been quite a few um, projects. One of them involved watching even the molting patterns on uh, mountain sheep in BC, uh, just to see if climate change was affecting the molting earlier or later. And um, seasonal or phenological differences um, also um, pr produce quite a lot of changes. And so if you see the photographs, one that was noticed by a student doing his project in university was a blue dragon, blue dragonfly and the coloring on the wings was different and they were wondering if they would be able to find each other of this in the species to mate because the coloration in the wings was just so pronounced and so different because of heat. The heat was removing the color in the in the wings. So um, citizen science is also a great way to work locally on the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, depending on which um, project you choose. So as well, if you pick a nature-based citizen science project, such as iNaturalist, it's a great way to enhance a professional ecological assessment. Now, you might undertake a professional ecological assessment to assess an environmental condition, to detect changes in the environment or any early warning signals, or to discover an environmental program. And then when you do a professional ecological assessment, there's quite a few stages being undertaken. And um, it's very interesting that a professional ecological assessment 
usually takes place within a day or maybe two or three days, depending on the budget uh, allocated to the ecological assessment. But if you supplement it with citizen science and something like the City Nature Challenge, you do get quite a lot of input and you see that the observers might be out there at any time of the day and in any season. And you get a much larger photograph and it enhances the ecological assessment done professionally. Um, Nature Saskatchewan is another group. Um, they host and promote Plant Watch within the Nature Watch community. And they also have programs to look after the Saskatchewan Chimney Swift and it's called the Initiative. They have Naturehood, uh, Feeder Watch, and they have their stewards. They have SOS stewards programming, like for Operation Birmingham, Clovers on the Shore, Shrubs for Shrikes, the Rare Pet Rescue, and the SOS Banner Program. So that uh, sure uh, wasn't spelled quite right. And um, here's another rare plant, uh, our rare dandelion in Saskatchewan. So there are very many more citizen science activities besides uh, the City Nature Challenge or besides using iNaturalist, there's eButterfly you can download. Uh, the Data Stream is a wonderful water monitoring uh, program. Um, they have one for the Great Lakes and they have one for the Lake Winnipeg Basin. And so the Saskatchewan rivers drain into uh, Lake Winnipeg. So that would be the Data Stream used for water monitoring here. And there's two different places to get water testing kits for classrooms and things. So um, that's also very exciting. Um, one of them is Water Rangers and the other one is the, the Safe Drinking Water Foundation. Uh, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is a wonderful way to hook up across Canada. It doesn't necessarily have to be around wetlands, rivers or the ocean. It can be, our pollution can get into the water table and into our drinking water quite a few different ways. So contributing to the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is a wonderful initiative and they give you a lot of support. The Loss of the Night app uh, helps to map light pollution and star visibility. And we have a Meteor Count app, Noise Tube app. The SciStarter Connection project is really, really excellent. If you go on SciStarter, it will help you to learn about all sorts of different citizen science uh, apps and programs that are available. And then we have uh, TREE is the Trans-Canadian Research and Environmental Education Program for dendrochronology. That's where out of the University of Saskatchewan uh, Mad Lab and it's really really fun. They um, take aspen trees because they kind of grow quite a few places all across Canada and they take a core sample and they're able to find out what has happened to that aspen tree throughout time and they put it into the uh, Canadian Light Synchrotron and they work with classrooms all across Canada. All you have to do is contact the Mad Lab and get involved with the tree project and it's quite a lot of fun. So not all citizen science apps or events are nature-based bio blitzes, but uh, the citizen, the city nature uh, challenge is. So um, before your event, um, so if you're signing up for the city nature challenge, that's of course, April 29th to May 2nd, those were the dates chosen for 2022. So we in Saskatoon had to sign up around September of the last year to get on board and we have to contact the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And you don't have to do too much throughout the various months. The more you do, um, possibly the more people you might get attending, but just getting the word out is a wonderful way to begin. And the Canadian Wildlife Federation and the Community Academy of Sciences do give you, they have the occasional webinar with you. They give you a few emails just to get, give you a leg up. They tell you what you have to do on a naturalist and um, they give you support there if you need it. Uh, and they sort of take you along the steps for the template. So let's just talk about citizen science planning events in general. So for a city nature challenge, the data is already selected. If you're doing a different citizen uh, science event, then you'd have to select a date. And for the city nature challenge, they did try to look for conflicts before they chose their dates. Um, if you're going to have it at different venues, you have to look for uh, permissions for hosting another cost. That's something you don't need to do for the City Nature Challenge because you're inviting people to take advantage of organisms in their backyard, their front yard, when they're walking the dog, when they're sitting at a soccer game, uh, watching their kids or uh, sitting at a baseball game, or even going to a green space for a picnic. 
So um, the City Nature Challenge is very intuitive and very easy to do. Um, you try to let everybody you can know about the event and you try to form an organizing committee just to um, help spread the word a little bit better and determine if you need volunteers. Um, for some events, um, volunteers might come hand handy, like if you were doing a walk, water testing sampling um, citizen science event. But for the City Nature Challenge, the volunteers you might need that might come in handy would be those that would run a bio blitz. Here or there for you because the more bio blitzes that you have um, operating between April 29th and May 2nd, that would be a way to have groups together if COVID protocols should so allow. And so far, it kind of looks like we're going to be okay for COVID that way. So a bio blitz, a lot of people don't know what that word means. Bio is kind of from biology and then blitzing, blitz is from blitzing. And you just try to get a whole bunch of people together. You give them a map of the trails or the green space that you're going to go to. And then you just say, we're going to all spread out and go our own way and try to find as many organisms in iNaturalist as we can for either a one hour period, a three hour period, however long you make your BioBlitz event last. And it's really, really fun. And then you come back and because everybody has signed into iNaturalist under their own username, you can compare the results afterwards and find out how many invasive species were found, how many rare species were found, and if there was anything exciting happened during that day. Um, for some of the citizen science events, um, these kinds of things might come in handy, like a budget for supplies or food or the venue or transportation or first aid. <coughs> so if there was a classroom wanting to go to a field trip um, and use City Nature Challenge, uh, I'd actually list in a different green space, um, then they might have to find something for a bus field trip. However, that being said, some classrooms could just go out in their school uh, park, their schoolyard, and uh, see what's in there. Because it's even interesting, someone actually just went out to the tree in front of their place on their boulevard and kept documenting it. And they were surprised how many insects were at that tree because the first day they found two or three, and then the next day they got a little bit better at spotting insects. And just spot going to one tree over and over again was just amazing what they had actually discovered in it. So um, I know that's why it's very intuitive and very friendly, the City Nature Challenge. You can make it as um, group oriented with all these foods and supplies and transportation, or you can just invite people into their own backyard, their own schoolyard, their pocket park, their farmyard, wherever they happen to be. So you might want to make a letterhead letter in the form of a request. If you want to get in-kind donated items, you could partner with or become a nonprofit or a charity if needed. And perhaps that way you could have things like food or water donated. And you could send proposals to organizations or sponsors who could support you. Um, sometimes getting some supporting money is handy if you want to print out some posters or, or some pamphlets or, or run something on the media. Um, you can try to do it as a under charitable status to run something in the media. So there's different things to think about depending on what level you want to be at. And actually the City Na Nature Challenge organizers do give you a very nice letter to send out to the media to see if they would do a, a um, community-based um, event uh, broadcast for you. And quite often the media will do that. So some checklists for what to think about if you're having a group event possibly would be to maybe just bring out a little bit of extra sunscreen, bug spray or band-aids if you're having a group event. Maybe have a photo release for participants. If COVID is still around, maybe have a waiver for participants to sign just so we know how many people were out during COVID so that there can be a contact afterwards. Um, you can determine how long you want people to be involved in your Bioprits, if there should be um, communication with a nearby um, service station or porta potties rented, or um, other citizen science events might need electricity or other things or insurance or that, but decorations too. But uh, generally speaking, a city nature challenge, you just uh, upload an actualist to the phone and then take pictures of, of nature and wildlife around you. But just some things to think about on a checklist um, as you go along. So iNaturalist is a smartphone app and um, it, it can be enhanced with group meetups or you can uh, just do it individually. Um, you can call your meetups a BioBlitz, an EcoQuest, 
scavenger hunts are really, really fun. You just make a list of different things that people might um, find and then they go around and see who's the fastest at finding the things on the list. And a bingo again, you just make up a paper with different things for people to find and see who could get a line the fastest for a blackout card. And it's just another way to add another degree of fun into being out in nature. So do you have to join a project on iNaturalist to be part of the City Nature Challenge? Not really. Um, your, any organizations you make will be recorded if you're inside the map that the iNaturalist project made. All you have to do is sign into the iNaturalist app with your username and your username can be anything you want it to be. And if you do sign in, you can get notifications of news posts and journal feeds. Uh, in that regards, it would be like if you uploaded, say, this picture of a black cap chickadee, and then later on someone came along with an identification, a specialist scientist or an identifier, that would come up on your news feed. It's sort of like a digest, you don't get them every day, but um, it just tells you that someone came around and looked at your observation and, and they thought that this bird was, maybe the first person said it was a bird, and then the next person came along and said it was a black cat chickadee. You never know. So this is what happens for City Nature Challenge, not registered for 2022, but they want to be involved. You, you do have to sign in to this project. So this is our naturalist, the City Nature Challenge 2022 Global Project. So do sign in to here if you want to make your observations count towards the City Nature Challenge. And um, the only way this will work for you is if you are in an area where there are no other City Nature Challenges already made. So that's a great way to, to be involved. This is how iNaturalist works. You just um, go to your flower and you take a picture of the top and the bottom of the flower, the bloom, and take a picture of the top and the bottom of the leaf. And you just go from, you stay at the same organism and you just keep pushing this plus sign. You take a picture of the whole habitat. You take a picture of the plant, the, how tall the plant is. And um, you keep taking as many images you, as you can using this plus sign. And um, automatically, iNaturalist is going to figure out what time you're out in the field and the GPS of where you're located, so the when and the where. And then you can uh, push on what did you see. And then the smart image recognition technology is going to make an identification. Um, if it was a flower, they, it would probably say it's a part of the plant kingdom. Um, if it was a frog or a fungi, it might say that. Or just put in what you think it might be if you don't agree with the natural suggestion or if you don't know. Um, and um, that will help to bring along the specialist scientists. If you are on an Android phone, save the observation at the top of the screen. If you're on an iPhone, save the observation at the bottom of the screen. And, and do save it or share it as soon as you're done with that particular organism. And then you go on to the next organism and then you try to take as many pictures of it as you can. Um, the reason why we say to take as many pictures using this plus sign as you can of one organism is because we never know what is going to be the identifying feature for the, that particular taxon. Like we have four species of wild roses in Saskatchewan and um, they all have the beautiful pink flower with the five petals and they look very much the same with the flower. So basically a specialist scientist does need to see the prickles on the stem or else they can't get to species level very easily. So because we do, might not know exactly what makes that organism get to species level, taking as many pictures as you can really does help because maybe you'll accidentally trigger onto the, um, the actual characteristic that brings it to species level. So when you select geo privacy, three choices will occur. They are open, obscured, and private. Open is the one everybody uses by the default, and it's just a pinprick of where that organism was seen. You can always see open on your own iNaturalist sign-in, but if you make it obscured or private, that's for everybody else for that organism. Obscured puts it in a large range without really being an identifiable, identifiable place. And private means there's no information about the location seen by the public at all. So um, you can choose to let projects on a naturalist see where your location was. So the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center might want to know where a species at risk is. So letting them have access to your uh, GPS uh, data might be very beneficial for the Saskatchewan 
Conservation Data Center to protect the species at risk. And there's another one called IMAP Invasive Saskatchewan. And if you open up your um, GPS location to IMAP Invasive Saskatchewan, that will help them to take care of it, help to know where the mapping of invasives is happening across Saskatchewan. So it's really easy to use. You have a naturalist loaded on your phone. You go out in nature and find some wonderful organism. You snap a picture, you share it with the community and you get into the identification phase. And you get to come back in later just to see what your um, species might be. So for the City Nature Challenge, um, it was kind of like a couple weeks before now we have to all uh, decide whether we wanted to sign up into Bio BioSmart Life. Um, BioSmart Life is an amazing uh, program online. It's, um, it connects various different apps. So right now Saskatoon's Nature Challenge is you can use iNaturalist. You can also use eBird and you can also use um, observation.org. So those are our three apps that we've signed into by signing into BioSmart Life. So that's kind of exciting because that increases the um, observations that you might get in your City Nature Challenge and uh, being supported by other observations from other apps. So another thing you can do for the City Nature Challenge, and this is up to you how much or how little you want to do, and um, you do get some guidelines and some guidelines through the City Nature Challenge um, organizers uh, from Canada, you'd get it from the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And we also have the um, organizers down in the USA that uh, provide some communications as well. So they help you with different ideas on getting on, into social media or uh, different ideas. They send out a letter actually. They send out a letter that you can use to connect with other people in your community. So you can email um, other green groups in your community and say, hey, the City Nature Challenge is happening on this date. This year, do you want to like help along and do some bio blitzes or get involved or different schools in your area? So that's what you get from the City Nature Challenge. If you were doing a citizen science event on your own, then you'd have to write your own letter to invite different people to participate. Um, you could put out, you could make a web page about it, social media, posters, pamphlets, and then the conventional media. And once again, if you're with the City Nature Challenge, they do give you a letter to send out to the conventional media. Um, you can modify it yourself, of course, but they do give you a very good template to work from. And they also give you a good template for social media and for posters as well. So you can decide to create Eventbrite pages, Facebook pages, Facebook event pages. And then there's various event calendars, quite often um, different radio and TV stations, different cities, um, different museums will have their own event calendars you can post your event on. And then there's bulletins and bulletin boards uh, that you can post on as well. Um, uh, SciStarter is another one that has a good event uh, posting place. So here we are again talking about collaborating and finding other green groups, in classrooms, youth groups, and then think outside of the box because maybe um, a senior citizen would really like to be involved with on a naturalist project and it would be something that they could do they just would need to have a naturalist uploaded on their app or maybe a newcomer group would like to be involved and get more familiar with the um, area around them so all these people might want to take part in a citizen science event and you can even involve the really really young kids if their family has a smartphone for them to use um, a, somebody that's under maybe the age of seven-ish, they can use a program called SEEK. So their family would upload, they would sign into iNaturalist. And then once iNaturalist was signed in and then the, the youngster used SEEK, anything they point the phone at registers the species and it gets counted towards the City Nature Challenge, but they don't actually have to manipulate it and take pictures and, and uh, do different um, manipulations on their phone. So it's very easy for the very young child to just point their camera at a bug and then it, it tells them what it is. So that's rather exciting. And the parents can go along with them and it's a great, great um, app that they've made. So you have to decide which social media you want to be in or if you have collaboration with a community of people or other volunteers, you can get them 
to be posting on other social media. Um, when you are at some of the City Nature Challenge meetings, like I said, there's not a lot of them, but they really do get a lot of information into their meetings. So they ask, what demographics are you targeting? So the, the meeting they had on social media kind of um, went into which of the um, social media kind of targets the older uh, viewer and which ones, which is Facebook and Instagram targets a bit of a younger and so forth and so on. So, um, and the other thing is when you receive the City Nature Challenge social media kit, that's a wonderful thing to share it around on your different um, apps as mentioned here. So decide what your key messages are, the, your, the, your main takeaways, uh, keep it simple and keep it short. So one way to do this is to write a story to yourself about the event. Um, think about every possible thing you might think about the event and then squish your whole big story into one paragraph and then take the time to squish that big long paragraph into one sentence and then condense that sentence into a Twitter uh, statement and then condense that Twitter message into one word. Then you're going to take, get your key message or your takeaway. So from this um, exercise, you can decide what your main nuggets of information you want for distribution about your particular citizen science event and um, what you are focusing on. And also make it really interesting for your participants when they're involved in your citizen science event. So for the City Nature Challenge, you're gonna to try to get them excited about the biodiversity. If you were going to do an astro astronomical event, you would maybe get in touch with an observatory or people with a telescope and go another way and try to enhance curiosity. And you have to build in incentives for your participants. So you could create a certificate for them for after they were finished. You could, um, there might be some swag available if you talk to some participating businesses in your area. Um, and you, whenever you communicate with them, you can build further and surround your original scientific goals and expand upon them. So one way is to, for the City Nature Challenge, just talk a little bit about biodiversity. And if you had a classroom out on a field trip, just go into what could be the interdependence of plants and animals in an ecosystem. Um, explore what the difference between a temporary and a permanent wetlands are and what you might find in the emergent vegetation. And look for organisms around you as you take pictures on a naturalist. It's kind of interesting when you're out in the field, there's just so much to take pictures of and so little time. So you're busy taking a picture of, of a plant and you're getting the top and the bottom of the plants and the leaves and the stem and everything. And as you're doing this, there's a, a, a pollinator species coming by. So you quickly share that without going into what is it uh, or putting in flowering plant or anything, just to take a picture of this insect, this the pollinator species. And you try to get as many pictures of it. And then when you come home, you try to do a little bit of identifications on them after. But uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing how, how many things you see once you start looking. It's kind of like a Where's Waldo puzzle, but in real life. So um, if you were with the class, you could ask it if it was a producer, a consumer, or a decomposer. Uh, you could find out um, as the plants and animals are interconnected, what could be the effects that you see right in nature. And then you could, um, questions to ponder. Um, what changes could be seen that affect the environment of each organism? And what would be the beneficial or harmful effects of various changes? Um, right now we're really focusing on climate change, but there might be other ones as well. Um, other maybe invasive species um, and how can humans adopt their behavior? And certain plants and animals need really specific habitats and environments. So as you look at your results, which organ or organisms are you seeing right there and why? And why won't you see it anyplace else? And are there native or indigenous species or are there invasive? And is that introduced species becoming so invasive that it's squishing the native species out? So this particular plant is a native species. It is only found in very specific habitats. It needs um, sort of a fen-like environment with lots of water, um, but not, not fully water. It just needs to be very moist soil quite often. It needs to have acidity in the soil. And, um, if, if all those various conditions aren't together all at the same time, you won't see this rare species. 
So it's rather interesting to see what specific habitats are needed and then if that habitat was changed, uh, whether this species at risk would totally disappear. So name your local citizen science event. So the City Nature Challenge goes on for four days. If you want to have four different days with four different in-person events, uh, that would be an okay. You could have a bio blitz one day and nature scavenger hunt another day and, and so forth and so on. EcoQuest is another name that's very similar to BioBlitz. Um, so you just try to download it, encourage everybody to download the iNaturalist app before they come out into the field and um, maybe sign in to the iNaturalist app at home if they want to take a few pictures out in their backyard just to have a little bit of practice. That's okay if you want, if they want to have a little bit of instruction in the field, that's okay too. We do have a YouTube online on our uh, Friends of the Saskatoon Afforestationaries YouTube channel and it's called What Is It? And it kind of goes into a little bit more detail about how to use the iNaturalist app just to make it really super easy when you're out in the field. And um, if you have to figure out COVID plans, um, do that ahead of time. Right now it looks like okay for 2022. And you, if you are having an in-person event, then just let people know and have maps ready or the how to get there with a GPS location or a street address. So here you can really convince um, the people that are coming out for your iNatural City Nature Challenge um, bio blitz when they're out in the field. Um, if they're not ornithologists already, they might go, oh my goodness, I don't know anything about birds and what am I doing out here? So you can just uh, bring some attention to birds by these some of these questions because if you just start commenting about which birds would sit at the top of dead trees, like a hawk, and which ones hide among the leaves of bushes, like a black-capped chickadees, which birds would flick their tails or bob up and down, like geese quite often bob up and down just to warn their little ones of their goslings of danger around. And um, different waterfowl will pretend to have a broken wing to lure their predators away from the nest. So, and uh, nuthatches will walk down a tree head first. Um, when you're out in the field, it's always a good idea to be aware of where the sun is a little bit because if you take a picture and you're looking at an organism and the sun is behind the organism, the organism is going to look silhouetted and black. It's kind of like taking a picture of someone in front of a window. But if you make sure the sun is behind you or at your side and you take a picture of an organism, it will turn out a little bit clearer. So if you want to make comments in the iNatural Health app, that is perfectly wonderful. Um, after you take a photograph, you can just comment on, um, the bird looked like he had something in his mouth and he might have been nesting. It looked like it could have been bigger than a robin. Um, I figured the color was uh, dusty gray, <coughs> just in case the sun is in the wrong place. And I did notice that he had this little black stripe at his neck. So you can just bring attention to some of the things you saw in the field. Uh, and that helps with the identification later. You don't have to make these comments, but if you want to, that's fine and dandy. So you can build on information you know and expand from there, because it's amazing how much you do know already. And um, you can, as you're in the field, you can help with the identifications where you can, or you can just put in bird for this little series. We're gonna be talking about birds. So in this case, we have um, a crow, when you're on a naturalist, you can record the sound uh, when you're in the field or take a photograph. And once again, you can kind of make, pay attention to questions like this, like, do you consider yourself a birder? And then pretty soon you realize you know more birds than you thought you did. So is, is the crow migratory or is it here all year round? Um, every once in a while crows will stay all year round, but usually in wintertime. You will see ravens, which are larger, and in the summer, you will see crows, which are a little bit smaller. And um, yeah. So here we have a picture of a robin. This is a standard for ornithologists. People, uh, ornithologists will ask, is the bird bigger or smaller than a robin? Because most people do know robins. They're a great signal of spring. And once again, record it or take a picture. Both are good. So, 
other questions you might consider as you're out in the field. And if, if you're intrigued about biodiversity, you might want to figure out which birds nest in trees or on the ground, like meadowlarks will nest on the ground and robins in a tree. Are there special markings? And as we can see with the robin, it's got this beautiful white ring around his eye and a black tip on his beak, as well as the beautiful red breast. Figure out if your bird lives near the wetlands, the woodlands, or the grasslands, and you can put that in the comments if you so wish to. And robins are migratory, but sometimes they are here all year round as well. Sometimes they know which years are going to be milder, and then you will see them here all year round. Now here is a blue jay. And again, you can figure out where does it eat. Quite often, just doing a bird feeder um, photograph for a naturalist is also fine. Um, it's a wild animal and um, it's a really fun project to do. If you have classrooms involved, you can tell them to get some pine cones off the ground, paint them with peanut butter, put some unsalted um, nuts on the edges of them, or even um, divide up an orange in half and put them in like an old um, discarded onion bag, those netted bags, and hang them from trees. And you can, um, without going to the store and buying an official bird feeder, you can have some interesting birds coming along just to, by hanging up some fruit or hanging up a peanut butter pine cone. So that's a lot of fun. So blue jays are again migratory. They're really fun to hear in the spring. And just consider how many birds do you know by sight or by their bird song? And here we have the Canada goose. And again, it's a, a water bird, but you might see it um, other places like alongside the shoreline of, of wetlands or, or flying overhead. They might um, feed at one place and uh, nest at, or roost and go to sleep at a different place. So these are generally migratory. And um, also consider like what other um, animals might you know, like mallards or snow geese and so forth and so on. So. And remember when you're out in the field, the sound recordings on iNaturalist are a fairly new feature and they can both contribute to uh, specialist science research. So you can do either or both for your observation. It, it doesn't matter, but it's nice to have a photograph or a sound recording to back up your observation. Um, frogs and amphibians are uh, usually an indicator species because frogs and amphibians um, really, really um, leave an ecosystem quickly if it's, if it's not, um, wonderful for them to live in. So that's why they're an indicator species. Um, again, there might be different calls for the various frog species in the BioBlitz area. Um, and um, different um, frogs need different things. Like in, in their younger stages for frogs and amphibians, they need sedges and rushes for protection and for food. And then in the adult stage, you might find a woodland frog more away from the wetlands and more towards the woodlands and the meadows. So it's rather interesting to do a little bit of um, looking at pictures on iNaturalist or reading about them and just delve into the, it just opens up a whole world of curiosity once you get into learning about nature and learning into iNaturalist as well. So here we have mushrooms, also called fungi, and lichen. Um, they are very, very usually hard to identify. Um, and so a lot of mushrooms and fungi and lichen don't have a very good identification going on for them. And the very sad thing is um, the team of specialist scientists that make up the Kasawik um, Board of Decision Makers that report um, the different statuses of species at risk to the Government of Canada Fungi and lichen aren't represented. Uh, there just uh, hasn't been enough interest and in, there hasn't been enough specialist scientists um, speaking up to be part of the Kosovic. So um, that is leaving our various fungi and lichen at a very um, hazardous state. And insects also are in a very awkward position. Um, they're called arthropods as well. Um, out of all the different kinds of taxon, whether it's mammals or birds or amphibians, insects have the largest amount of species, like by like a lot. And there are so many insects that there are 
there are still new species being identified and quite often scientists are saying that um, sometimes an insect won't even have been identified and it will have become extinct and we won't have even known about it that it even existed so that's the very sad thing about insects so having citizen science events like the city nature challenge are absolutely amazing for these two taxons and some people were wondering what the heck am i going to find in saskatchewan between april 29th and may 2nd that's way too early this was set by people in california and they just don't know nothing about saskatchewan but lichen are always around, so that would be a wonderful thing to take a picture of. And things like these, these conchs or polypores on the trees, those are always going to be around, so you could take pictures of them. And insects are starting to wake up. Um, I looked at iNaturalist for last year, and there were both butterflies as well as moss and um, caterpillars. And I've already seen house flies, and I haven't been out for crocus hunting in Saskatoon yet, but I have seen quite a few pictures on Facebook of other people that have been out and the crocuses not only have poked up their little noses, but some of the blossoms, well, before the snow fell, some of the blossoms had opened. Now we're gonna to have to wait for this funny spring snowfall to melt. So afterwards, if you had a bio blitz or a field trip with the classroom, you might want to give the teacher or somebody a survey just to discover how your citizen science event went. If you're doing water samples, you might want to uh, get some feedback about whether or not it went well, if they liked the particular water body that they were at, if there was anything that could have been done differently. So figure out some questions and uh, pass it around just to get feedback in case you want to carry on a little bit more with citizen science events and examine your results. Um, so right now, um, as the first time study of Saskatoon has been involved with the City Nature Challenge, we haven't been in this capacity to examine our results. Um, when we did the first session on the history of the City Nature Challenge, we looked at some of the results that Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Regina and Calgary had gotten from the last year's City Nature Challenge. and what kind of species at risk, what kind of um, invasive species, and just some uh, unique species that they had found. Um, so that's probably what we'll do with the Saskatoon City Nature Challenge and um, bring it back to why we originally, what the original goal was for having the citizen science event in the first place. So um, it's kind of a fun thing to do the City Nature Challenge and do the goals of having sort of a mini fun challenge or competition between the various cities to see which city can get the most people out, which city and area can find the most species, and which city and area can find the most organisms. But really it is a tool for bringing education and awareness about conservation, about ecological processes, and environmental or scientific processes for specialist scientists around the world. They help to connect people to nature and they help to make them more aware of nature. And it furthers the goal of scientific research through the contribution of data. Um, when we did the uh, session before this one, which we'll post online, we kind of went into what kind of science we, scientific research was benefit through the contribution of data. And if you watch the What Is It YouTube, we went into the um, goals of scientific research that were benefited also. And then there's a bit of marketing phases for the when and the where. So this particular scientific um, output uh, did help Nick Bellaby from Saskatchewan working on his master's thesis. Um, he was researching the floral visitors to the starvation prickly pear cactus and he used iNaturalist. And so he was able to identify who came along and visited this cute little flower and um, it really did help um, him with his scientific research. So he was able to do an analysis of the population size of the various pollinator species, because if he found them in the starvation prickly pear, he could do a count of how many pollinator visitors were in the area on, from my naturalist observations. He could see what other kind of pollinators might be in the area of the starvation prickly pear. And, Maybe none of them did visit this prickly pear and then also wonder why that would be. And then uh, 
wonder about any threats or declines or any factors for any pollinator species that the starvation prickly pear might need. This is the story about the dragonfly wing coloration and temperature. Michael Moore was the graduate biology student and this is a picture of a blue dasher dragonfly, the one he was studying. And quite a few um, newspapers and scientific journals picked up the story. And one of the most interesting consequences of this study is that Michael Moore used pictures from a naturalist for his scientific research. And he found that the male wing pigmentation is evolving in response to rapid climate changes. And the female pigmentation is evolving in reaction to something else. And they're just kind of wondering if females may no longer be able to identify males of their own species, which is um, kind of sad that they're losing their wing wing. So here we have, uh, we mentioned this a little bit in the session right before this one, but um, here we have someone that took a picture of um, this leaf, this evidence of insect um, destruction on a leaf in um, southern Quebec. And um, a specialist scientist got pretty excited and he asked for collaboration. Like, could this be a European species coming to North America? And it was confirmed that it probably was the elm zigzag stock fly. So this is the larval um, stage and this is the adult stage of the elm zigzag sawfly. So because it was found on iNaturalist, a random find led to a huge discovery and early detection and rapid response was then initiated to this in in invasive species. So scientific reporting, if you were going to be a biologist or something, you could um, do a citizen science event, go to a specific scientific topic. If you were doing some graduate research and you could set out your abstract with the purpose of your event or what you were looking at on iNaturalist and set out your indicators for how you're going to derive your goal or purpose, you could set a hypothesis and then you could see a thing out in the field proved or disproved your hypothesis. You could figure out what tools you you were going to use like eBird or Na iNaturalist or if you were doing a different kind of survey like with water samples. Um, you would have to figure out your procedures. Um, an ecological lab might have uh, different procedures and stay in certain areas and a bio blitz would be a little bit different. Taking a magnifying glass out in the field is kind of handy because some people are able to put the magnifying glass in front of their iPhone lens and take a picture a little bit larger. And taking a ruler or a tape measure in your pocket is also handy because if you took a picture of scat and you didn't know whether it was deer or moose from the photograph and you weren't sure the size of it, it would be handy to have the observer uh, put in a, just dig in their pocket to see if they had a quarter in their pocket or if they had a ruler or put their hand beside it just for scale. And sometimes that's also handy for um, the seed head on grass. Our native species of grass are so delicate. And if you held up the end of the grass stem and the seed head is up here and you held it against the green of the trees in the background, the seed head might just disappear green on green. So if you put your hand in behind, then it would be very easy for the identifier to figure out what kind of grass species it is, for an example, and it would also have the scale against your hand. So then um, on scientific reporting, a biologist might go into a discussion and the conclusion and various references. So you could do an examination or an analysis. And as I said, Saskatoon and Erie hasn't done this part yet, but it's a wonderful way to relate the outcome report to the original goals of the citizen science venture when you were uh, first setting out, whether you were going to do astronomy or a bio blitz or water testing. And you could see how closely the outcomes of the um, citizen science event were um, achieved in the field through the citizen science campaign. They have found a huge amount of success on iNaturalist just because it is so intuitively easy to use and because you can sign into iNaturalist. And if you're younger than about the age of seven and the adults are signed into iNaturalist and the younger ones use some, the program called SEEK, which is another um, program made by the same company. Um, all you have to do is pick up your phone and point it at the organism and the SEEK will tell you, come up with what it is using the iNaturalist database. 
and it also records it for the City Nature Challenge results. So even the very young people um, can be involved as well. So that's really, really exciting. So in Saskatoon, we have some beforehand webinars, like for instance, this one, as well as we have four in-person events. One is at George Jennery Park, and another one at Richard St. Bar Baker, another one at Richard St. Bar Baker, and another at George Jennery. So we have one, <coughs> excuse me, for every day of the um, City Nature Challenge, just in case people do want to get together as a group. But like I say, you can do it individually as well, in your own backyard, in your own pocket park, when you're out watching a baseball game. And if you want to find out any events we're going to have on, uh, this is our event five page. And we also have them on our website, which is friendsareas.ca. We also have some ver various webinars. One tomorrow is how to use iNaturalist to sort out noxious invasives from beneficial pollinator species. So if you want to start getting out some weeding, you don't want it to uh, be pulling the species at risk. So this tells you how iNaturalist will come to the rescue. And we also have the Saskatchewan Mycological Society talking about fungi and lichen, because as we said before, that's going to be a very popular find um, at this time of the spring. We'll have um, the City of Saskatoon um, entomologist talking about some insect hints and tips. Afterwards, we'll have an ID party focusing on plants. If you've taken a picture of a plant and you don't know what it is and it hasn't been identified, come to this ID party and it will be fun. Then we also have the Saskatchewan Mycological Working Group coming to this to help you out with your fungi and lichen observations for identification. And then we also have the just an ID party. If you're having an ID uh, question about anything else or you have too many unknowns and you would like to just learn more about using iNaturalist, come to this um, ID party on May 6th. So this is who we are. We're the friends of the Saskatoon Afforestation Areas. We decided to host the City Nature Challenge. These are the two Afforestation Areas in Saskatoon, George Jennery at 148 acres and Richard St. Bar Baker Afforestation Area at 326 acres. They're located near Montgomery Place neighborhood over by the CNR Chapel Yards on either side of Sask Highway 7 or the Pike Lake Highway. The West Whale connects the North Saskatchewan River and the South Saskatchewan River. It used to be a glacial spillway and uh, we still see remnants of the wetlands uh, through the area. Um, so that's what we do. We, we help to protect and preserve these two afforestation areas. This is our website, friendsareas.ca. This is our blog page, stbarbaker.wordpress.com. Uh, Richard St. Bar Baker was an amazing global conservationist. He, he was around before David Suzuki. He traveled the world by steamer. In his later years, he traveled by airplane, but he did a lot of his communication by memorizing his um, postal mail addresses. And he had a really large network and he visited he, his International Tree Foundation that he founded in 1922. It uh, at its peak was in 105 countries that he traveled to. Um, so he was amazing. He, he didn't have the power of the internet to help him out when, when he was active preserving forests and planting trees worldwide. And George Jenner was a pretty amazing fellow too. He was our Canadian only gold Olympic medalist at the 1952 um, Olympics. And so that's pretty awesome. And then he went on to become a radiologist and a, pro a professor of radiology. And he was a very well-known speaker and a meticulous illustrator. So both these people were very, very awesome. This is how you do contact us uh, by email. So if you want to get involved in another City Nature Challenge for next year, uh, just email us and we'll put you in contact with the Canadian Wildlife Federation so you can come on board. And if you know of anybody in any of our other Saskatchewan cities or any other city anywhere, um, we can put you in touch with whom to contact to come on board with the City Nature Challenge because we would like to see more cities involved next year because we figure it's a really great idea. We've seen the amazing biodiversity documented on iNaturalist and how much uh, scientific research has been benefited by citizen science. So I will stop talking here and if anybody wants to put anything into the chat as a question or uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question, 
that would be wonderful. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you.